everyone. I'm Betsy Peck, Learned Dean of University Libraries, and I'd like to welcome you all to our final Talking in the Library event for the fall semester. All of our Talking in the Library events um, are generously supported by um, an alumna of the university, Mary Tuft White, and she, um, she also donated funds to redo this space that we're sitting in, which has breakout walls for a crowd such as this. So thank you all for coming. Um, we're so fortunate to have Robert Boyers here this evening, um, whom Adam Braver, our library program director and creative writing professor, will introduce in a moment. Adam and Bob have known one another for many years through a well-known Writers Institute at Skidmore College, where Bob has taught as a member of the faculty, the English faculty, my, my uh, major, for many years. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention the spring semester talking in the library events. Um, in February, we will host English literary critic James Wood. In April, our student writing fellowship, the Vermont Fellowship for Fiction or Nonfiction, will be taught by Sigrid Nunez, who just won the National Book Award for her novel, The Friend. She will be teaching a master class to students who are selected for that fellowship, and we'll, it will end with a reading at Rogers Free Library in Bristol. So I hope you'll all come to those. And later in April, in celebration of National Poetry Month, we'll host Robert Pinsky, a very well-known poet. Quite a great lineup for the spring, thanks to Adam Braver. So I hope you will all join us. And now I'd like to ask um, Adam to come up and introduce our speaker. All right, well, thank you all for coming out. There are um, plenty of seats up front, too, for anybody who might have trouble hearing. Um, what's going on, I just want to be closer. Uh, I also want to just give the uh, general reminder about silencing cell phones um, during the talk. Um, there will be some time for question and answer um, um, after, uh, after the main points. And also, just out, outside the door, the bookstore is selling copies of um, Robert Boyer's new book. Um, I believe it is $22.50 with tax um, out, outside the, the door. When it comes to what we discuss and how we can discuss it, here is the question at its most basic. What are the lines and who gets to define them? In authoritarian regimes, we know that answer. And we know the equation is simple. Create black and white rationales, pit one perspective against the other, and set up a construct in which one side is clearly right and the other clearly is wrong. But here in the academy, in the university space, we are supposed to eschew the simplistic, jingoistic, and jargon-based perspectives. We are obliged to value debate, discussion, evidence, and reason. We understand that issues are blurry, messy, complicated, and nuanced. It is our role and purpose as people in higher education, be it student or faculty, to wade through the muddy waters of ideas, to acknowledge the contradictions, and to search out the higher truths through the lens of reason. That very role, so important, has been essential to progressing thought, from the critical understandings in the humanities, to the theories of the social sciences, to the life-changing discoveries in the sciences. And if you still remain suspicious about my argument, you can ask why students, scholars, and universities right now are under threat from authoritarians around the world based on what we would call free expression or academic freedom, be it through intimidation, surveillance, dismissal or expulsion, travel restrictions, imprisonment, threats to institutional autonomy, and in countries such as Turkey, shutting down universities altogether. The very idea of the role of the academy the very notion of the complexity of, the, of, of ideas and the need for that to prosper is at the heart of Robert Boyer's new book, The Tyranny of Virtue. Part memoir, part criticism, and part plea, Boyer's, who for most of his professional life has been identified as a, quote, East Coast liberal academic and writer, asks if that role of the academy hasn't been replaced by prescribed perspectives not meant to ask hard questions and at times suffer through the rigor of contradictions and evidence that sometimes add up to a kind of perfect imperfection, but rather, as his book title implies, with an intent to confirm a kind of virtue 
inherent in its own biases. For a little background, which you just heard a bit from Betsy, Robert Boyers is a professor of English at Skidmore College, where he's taught for over 50 years. A highly regarded literary and cultural uh, critic, Boyers also founded and continues to publish Salma Gundi, a journal of writing and ideas that for over five decades regularly has showcased the greatest minds of our time, from Susan Sontag to Saul Bellow to Milan Kundero to Frank Bedard to Jamaica Kincaid, Marilyn Robinson, Joyce Carol Oates, Philip Lope, Rick Moody, and on and on and on and on. And if I sound a tad bit familiar with him, as Betsy said, it's because I've worked for Bob for almost 16 years at the New York State Summer Writers Institute, which he directs. And I count myself fortunate to have been able to be among many of the people I just mentioned and to hear those great minds at work and at play. So I invite you to listen to Professor Boyers and when his presentation is completed, to engage with him, to ask questions, to work toward finding a truth. Isn't it better if we participate in defining the lines that can or cannot be crossed rather than having them defined for us? Robert Boyers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam, and thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, how I came uh, to write this kind of book. Um, so um, a little bit of this will sound like, uh, like a sort of a craft talk um, and a bit of a memoir. Um, I will read just a couple of pages from the book itself just to give you uh, a feeling for what it sounds like and a couple of different points. And then, most especially, I look forward to taking questions, right? Um, so, I, I, uh, when I was young, um, I, I always heard from people in my uh, family that uh, I was uh, a good arguer. Um, I like to argue. Um, we often had ferocious political arguments at our kitchen table. We didn't have a dining room, but we had a kitchen table. And uh, we conducted our arguments there. And the arguments you know, had to do with all sorts of things, but principally politics. Um, my family was working class, um, uneducated. And uh, so we didn't talk about literature. We didn't have any books uh, in my house. We didn't have a bookcase. Uh, we had a newspaper uh, each day, and, uh, and I was encouraged to read it and to think about some of the issues that were raised in, those, in that newspaper, which is called, by the way, the New York Post. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, uh, a very long time ago. And, um, and as, I, um, as I got older, um, I began, to, when I went to, to college and graduate school, um, I became invested in, um, in political uh, issues and uh, joined political organizations and um, always thought of myself as someone who was um, uh, an activist. Um, I was a war resistor uh, in the 1960s, um, refusing to, to uh, go and fight in the war in Vietnam. Um, that was part of my, my conviction and my commitment at the time. And at that very time, in the mid-1960s, I uh, founded uh, a magazine called Sal Gundy, a quarterly magazine, which I set up with a few of my friends. And, um, and it was a magazine committed to, um, to literature, the arts, and politics. And um, one of the things I, I most enjoy doing um, in connection with that magazine was organizing conferences, meetings, symposia, where I would get to invite um, very interesting people um, to sit around a table for three days um, discussing and debating a topic. The topic ranged um, all the way from uh, the clash of civilizations, to lying and liars, to psychological man, to race and racism in America. Um, and the, one of the principal features um, 
of those um, meetings that I organized was that it consisted of people who clearly disagreed with one another and to, to a very considerable degree, in some cases, actually even disapproved of one another. And of course, they had to sit there together at the table over three days. We generally would run those conferences for 15 hours. If you haven't ever done that, think about it. It's challenging. It's hard to sit at a table with people who are just as smart as you are, just as smart as you are, who come prepared just in the way that you've prepared, um, and to know that whatever you say, um, you will be challenged. Whatever you don't have evidence to support, someone will ask you to provide it, right? And that you are, of course, in the same way required to come back at them with the same kinds of challenges and demands. No escape, no place to hide. Um, when we would run these meetings, which were tremendously stirring, stimulating, um, when they were over, they would all be taped, and, uh, and, and our student assistants uh, would transcribe them, and then I would spend months um, editing them, trying to make them coherent, and then we would bring them out as special issues of our magazine, uh, Salma Gandhi. And there have been um, three dozen of these special topics, issues of Salma Gandhi of, over the years. Why am I telling you this? Well, basically, again, to suggest that um, argument, polemic, dispute, disagreement has always seemed to me at the heart of what I call the liberal enterprise. And it seems to me um, something that's central also to what we might call academic life. Um, it's what we want to see um, in the classroom as much as possible. We want people to feel um, that they are able to dispute what they hear in the classroom, including, by the way, things uh, coming at them from the front of the room, from the professor. Um, and of course, we want students to feel that they can challenge things that are coming from other students in the room. That's the sort of nature of the discourse that I've always most valued. And it's the thing that drew me to academic life when I was young, and that made me want to go to graduate school and become a professor myself. And uh, it's the sort of thing uh, I've been drawn to do as a writer pretty much all of my uh, adult life. Um, much of the writing that I did for many years, for decades, um, certainly in the first eight or nine books that I that I wrote, um, rightly falls under the heading of criticism. It's criticism. Criticism of books, criticism of political ideas, criticism of particular writers, criticism. The sort of thing that you read in brief, in a newspaper column, uh, not in a news story, but in a newspaper column on the op-ed page, for example, the sort of thing you read um, uh, at much greater length um, in a magazine of ideas like Harper's Magazine or The Nation or The New Republic or The Atlantic, those kinds of magazines. Um, and um, that was what I always wanted to do. Um, and it's what I did. I did it in the articles I wrote, hundreds of articles for those kinds of magazines um, and in the books that I wrote. But um, over the years, uh, I became more and more attracted to another kind of writing, um, which um, in general I think we refer to as personal essay or memoir. Perhaps some of you have been doing that sort of writing in classes um, here at, at Roger Williams. Um, it's become more and more uh, a feature of contemporary literary life. A great many people are attracted to the form of the personal essay and the memoir. Um, it's hard even to imagine uh, for those of you um, who are not old enough to remember, but not so very long ago, um, 
criticism and so-called memoir were completely or almost entirely, with very few exceptions, completely separate matters. So for example, if you were to read a book review uh, in the New Yorker magazine, okay, to pick a, right, a very prominent national magazine, um, you would know nothing about the relationship of the person who wrote that review to the material in the review. That person writing the review would tell you nothing about himself or herself in the review, nothing. Um, and when I wrote my reviews or essays uh, for Harper's or the New Republic or the Nation or the many magazines that I wrote for over the course of my career, the same way. You would know nothing about my relationship to those subjects. You would know what I thought about a particular issue. Uh, you would know whether I liked or disliked the particular book I was reviewing, but you would know nothing about me. You wouldn't know where I came from. You wouldn't know how I came to entertain these kinds of thoughts rather than those, uh, because that was simply not the way it was done. Um, and then, uh, as I say, I, I began to discover that increasingly that sharp demarcation separating uh, criticism and memoir or personal essay began to um, erode. And um, increasingly, many of us in the profession began to talk with one another about uh, ways in which we could bring these kinds of things together. Now, I'm not suggesting that this was completely um, original with us, with people of, of my generation. Um, some of you have perhaps um, studied um, the essays of George Orwell. And if you had, um, you would perhaps have confronted right, uh, an example of a writer who, going all the way back to the period of the 1930s and 40s, uh, when, when Orwell was doing his writing, um, was able um, to blend uh, personal essay with argument, criticism, analysis, polemic, and to do it in a completely persuasive and powerful way. Um, but somehow um, that example represented by Orwell seemed almost out of reach for the rest of us. I can't exactly say why. Um, but, uh, but it did. Um, in the 1990s, um, my wife, Peg Boyers, who is a, a terrific poet, um, became deeply um, absorbed with the work of an Italian uh, writer named Natalia Ginsberg. Um, and uh, we went to Rome um, in the very early 90s, and uh, my wife interviewed her on a couple of occasions for, for publication, and, uh, and we, we ran a special um, issue of our magazine devoted to Ginsburg's work, and Ginsburg was another one of those figures who could write about herself, her children, her husband, uh, her marriage, um, her religious conversion, her feelings about abortion, um, in the most intimate and personal way and make that kind of material seem to have a deep um, and resonating political import. Um, that in some way, as okay, my, my wife was um, drawn to this work and as a result, um, I began to read it as well. And, uh, and um, for some reason, these things are sometimes mysterious. That did it for me. That, that was the thing that broke open in me, something that I didn't really know I could do before. Um, and so I began to think about um, finding a way to write about myself, my life, my marriage, my children, um, my friendships, all kinds of doubts um, and misgivings I had about a thousand different things, and do it in a way that would make my own experience seem somehow representative of the experience that other people were having at the same time. A hard thing, right? Because when you want to write, when you write about yourself, 
right? You want it to seem very particular, very specific, right? You don't want to write about yourself as a generic person, right? As a male. You want to write just about yourself as a particular male with a particular background, who comes from a particular place, who had particular problems, who went through particular kinds of crises and so on. Right? You, you, if you're going to write about yourself, you want to write about yourself as an actual individual person. And yet, you want at the same time to do that in a way that makes your own peculiar experiences and thoughts and feelings um, seem to other people who read about these things um, to connect with things that they too are going through or might conceivably go through uh, in the future. And so um, I slowly uh, began to experiment with, uh, with that um, about 15 years ago. Um, slowly, uh, I began to publish some, some essays um, along those lines, in a couple of cases for um, anthologies where I was commissioned to write these pieces. Uh, and then I suddenly found that I, I wanted to write a book um, using this, this kind of thing. And so uh, I did a first book that, that came out um, about five years ago called The Fate of Ideas, in, in which I, I, I did this sort of thing. Um, and then shortly afterwards, um, I was so, and now I'm gonna turn really to, to the subject of my most recent book, which is the subject really that perhaps we'll be talking about in questions and answers in a little while. Um, I, I've been teaching um, on a college campus for 51 years. Um, I also taught on a graduate school campus in New York City at the New School for Social Research for 25 years. So I have a lot of experience in uh, the academy and campus life. I've taught thousands of students. I'm very close friends with many of my former students who come up and see us and stay in our house on the weekend. And uh, I know where they've come from. I know what they're thinking. And I've been um, increasingly disturbed by many of the things that I have observed on college campuses in the last decade or so. Um, and I decided I had to try to find a way to write about these things. So I, um, I wrote an essay, one essay, and uh, it came out in the pages of um, an important educational magazine called The Chronicle of Higher Education uh, about five years ago. Um, and that essay brought in hundreds and hundreds of letters. Um, some of them were private letters. Um, letters from college presidents and deans who basically said, in a variety of different ways, if you think what you're describing is bad, you should see what goes on on my campus. I could tell you stories you haven't dreamed about. That was sufficient encouragement for me to go forward. So I wrote a second piece, also in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and got comparable kinds of feedback. And there I knew uh, I was set. I, I was, had a sabbatical leave coming up. I left the country, and uh, I, I wrote um, the rest of this book. Um, so what does the book do? Well, one of the things it does is to engage with um, things that you really, for the most part, only hear about um, vaguely if you're outside the university, if you're reading occasional news articles about things going on in the university. Um, and of course, many of these things um, you only know about in an intimate way if you yourself belong not only to that community, to an academic community, 
But if you yourself belong to that part of the academic community, which is often described as the left liberal cultural bubble, I am a long-term denizen of the left liberal cultural bubble. I am a political liberal. I've been so all of my life. I know where many of the uh, people are coming from who are behind the things that I try to describe and grapple with uh, in my book. So uh, I'm, I'm writing, for the most part, about my own people, my own cohort. Right? I'm not targeting people who have political views that are drastically different from my own. I'm writing, for the most part, about my own colleagues, my friends, the people who sit at my dinner table on Saturday nights, um, the people who work at my Writers Institute in the summer. Um, I, I'm writing about us, about our own cohort. And it seemed to me the best way to go about doing that um, was to write very personally from the inside. Now, what does it mean to write personally from the inside? Well, there are a lot of ways of thinking about that, right? how, how you do that. I mean, obviously, one thing you can do is you can tell stories. Right? You can tell stories. This happened. That happened. This is what I thought. This is what I felt. This is what these other people thought and felt. You, you can do it that way. Another way, related, not, not completely unrelated, um, is to try to make your writing a kind of a conversation. What do we mean by that? We say, make your writing a kind of conversation. Well, I tried to find a way to create a conversation, first of all, with myself, where I could interrogate myself and ask um, whether I don't have all sorts of misgivings about my own opinions, about my own views, to ask whether, um, in fact, I'm capable of seeing some of the things I'm trying to describe as clearly as I like to think I actually do see them. So that's one kind of conversation, right? A conversation you can have with yourself. The kind of conversation probably every person in this room now and again, maybe frequently, has, right? You, you, you say, but where, what am I doing? What am I saying? You hear something come out of your mouth, and you look at the faces of people in front of you, and you can tell right away on many occasions they're not hearing it the way you meant it, right? And, you, and you're asking yourself, why, why are they not hearing it the way you meant it? Um, is it just that you got a, you, you said the wrong word? Um, is it that you somehow have failed to make yourself clear? You, you ask yourself those kinds of questions, right? Um, but then there's another way of conducting a conversation in a piece of writing of the sort I'm describing. Um, and that is the conversation you conduct with other people within the framework of the thing you're writing, where, for example, you allow other people to speak in the piece you're writing, and you respond to them. Um, you try to interrogate their thoughts. You try to understand where they're coming from. You try to understand why what they're saying doesn't quite break through to you. What kinds of defenses have you built up in yourself that makes you resist the things that those people are saying to you. And of course, if those kinds of conversations are going to be powerful as, as writing, powerful in terms of shaking you to your root, it's really important, if you can manage this, that the people you are listening to are people you can find a way to respect, or even better, people you might find a way to love. In one of my chapters of my new book on the subject of identity, I have an extended 
series of conversations back and forth with my son and son-in-law, uh, my, my gay son and my gay son-in-law, um, two people who are as close to me as anyone uh, I've ever known, who see things about identity in ways that are rather different from the way I see them. I let them speak. I try to, to hear them. I try to answer them, right? Uh, I, resp I, I talk back to them, right? I don't pretend that I get what they're saying. And no, I, 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 I confess that I don't always get what they're saying. And I try to meet them part of the way, right? Out of love, out of respect, out of a desire to understand what we mean when we talk about identity, when we ask ourselves the question, now that we all ask ourselves again at one point or another, who am I? What am I? Um, how does my identity affect the way that I think and speak and feel? So, so this is, um, um, in many ways, the nature of the, the sort of the book uh, that I've written, um, which I wanted to sort of give you an, uh, a little bit of a, a preliminary uh, outline of in, in this way. Um, and if you think about the subjects in the book, there are many different subjects in the book. Right? There are chapters devoted to some of the hot button topics that many of you, without any question, have heard about and in many cases have thought about uh, over these recent years, even if you're not deeply invested in contemporary uh, political issues. Uh, there are chapters of my book devoted to identity, uh, disability, privilege, appropriation, hmm? hot button topics, right, that people are discussing and debating at the present moment. And I try to come at each one um, in a way that will seem personal and intimate and yet also rigorous. And throughout, Throughout, I'm conducting not just an analysis, but an argument. I'm arguing um, for thinking clearly and honestly about subjects which are often not engaged in an honest way. That is a, a, a sort of a current that runs all through the book that I've written. So what's a demand that I try to make of myself, and only my reader, of course, can tell me whether I succeed in this, um, but it's a demand uh, I, I make of my students, um, even in undergraduate writing classes. Um, so, of course, you, you ask yourself, when you're gonna write something, do you actually have something to say, right? Do you have something to say? Is the thing you have to say worth saying, an important question, right? Not always easy to answer. One more question, I think, essential, really essential. Is um, the thing that you want to say something with which an intelligent person could conceivably disagree? If the answer to that question is, I don't think so, well then my response would be, then you don't have anything to say. Hmm? I'll do that one more time. Is the thing that you have to say something with which an intelligent person could conceivably disagree? And it, again, if the answer to the question is no, you have nothing to say, and there's no reason to go forward, no reason to write what you think to write. And I think that would be true if you were writing an ambitious term paper, right? an ambitious book review, and certainly it's true if you want to write an essay for um, a national magazine. And so, um, 
with that as a kind of a, uh, a kind of a guideline, um, I, I've gone forward. And you know, um, I can tell you honestly, just simple, candor, um, that in this new book of mine, as in the previous one, there were chapters I began, moved through to a very considerable degree, 10 pages, 15 pages, only to discover that I actually didn't have something to say. I thought I had something to say, but I didn't. And so I would just eliminate those drafts and so on and, and find other things to say. Well, I thought for a moment um, that I might um, give you just a couple of very short examples um, of the kind of conversation um, that um, I like to think of myself conducting in this book. Uh, the first one, very brief excerpt, is from um, the front of the book, the preface to the book. Um, and I think when you hear it, whether you like it or not, that's, that's up to you, I think you'll hear something that's uh, a little bit unusual. Um, I thought to write the preface to the book as a sort of a conversation directly, overtly, with myself. And so I decided to write it in the second person, using you throughout, right? Addressing myself as you. Um, it's the kind of thing that can become very annoying after a very short while, really annoying. And uh, I would find it very annoying um, in someone else. And so I decided that I could only do this in a short preface to my book. And once I came to the end, I knew, well, that's the end of that. That, that, that cannot happen anymore. Um, but it has an odd sound, and I thought I would share it with you, okay? Just very briefly, I'm not gonna read you the whole preface, just a little fragment in the front. A student at a graduation party tells you she thinks you're woke, and you say, thank you, and you're not sure you know what that means. It's no small thing, she continues, for an old white guy like you. And so you think further about it the next day, try to process the idea. Obvious that you can talk the talk, invoke the system and the market, inequality and abuse, neoliberalism and privilege, that you don't offend. After three classes with you, the student probably means mainly that you don't offend. Willing to talk politics when teaching your courses, not averse to assigning books, sure to provoke unrest. And yet, no prospect, you think, that you will spontaneously utter something that will lead decent people to walk out or turn their backs. Decent people, the kinds who sign up for your classes, attend your lectures, read your articles, occasionally send you email letters to express their encouragement or their disappointment. Even your kids, who are given to noting your deficiencies, assure you that you've written nothing to embarrass them. Not yet, though they are wary of your insistence on coming out with things uncomfortable or contrarian, your habit of criticism, your tendency to quarrel with people in your own left liberal cohort, the pleasure you take in saying no to things many of your friends embrace may be too reluctant to let people know you're with them, pissed off about always needing to show your papers and confirm you're on board, wanting to have it both ways, wanting to be woke and yet disdainful of the rituals and empty posturing that signify your determination never to offend. In truth, if truth be told, not always on board, even with but what passes for the higher wisdom in your own herd of independent minds. Your friendly demeanor no longer sufficient to cover over the fact that you are unwilling to sit quietly, hands nicely folded, 
in the total cultural environment many of your friends and colleagues want to inhabit total in that all are expected to speak with one voice about the right and the true, no misgivings permitted, an environment in which naysayers and dissidents are routinely asked to leave the room. Not always asked, you say, wondering not for the first time how you can have avoided that fate yourself. Do you hear that voice? Yes, that's, that's a certain kind of voice. It's a little harsh. It's a little harsh, yes? It's very direct, right? Um, and, uh, and of course, it's direct in several different senses of the word direct, right? Because it's directed at certain uh, issues, right? And persons uh, out there in my own cohort, my own environment, and also directed at myself, right? And sort of introducing Right, right up at the front of the book, um, a person who is alert to what other people are saying and thinking, including his own kids, um, who are not an entirely thrilled uh, all the time with what he's, this guy seems to be saying and thinking with his own habit of criticism, of taking no prisoners, right? So, so that's, that's one kind of a voice. And again, I think even just in those two pages you can hear, it's not the sort of voice you would be uh, well advised to use over the stretch uh, of a book, not even over the stretch of a long essay. It, it just wouldn't work. I think uh, it might very well <clears throat> provoke someone enough to, to make them want to throw the thing across the room uh, after about eight or ten pages, right? And yet, for maybe five or six pages, you might think, oh, this is sort of interesting. This guy has a kind of an edge. It might, might see what, what comes next. And so, um, when I thought about this, um, after I had written um, the book, all of the various chapters of the book, I, I had to think about, well, what would, I, what would I want to follow that voice with, um, right? If this is a little harsh, a little edgy, a little forbidding, right, what would I want to do? So I decided to put as a second chapter in the book uh, a chapter on the subject of privilege um, because that chapter begins with a lengthy first-person anecdote, um, which has to do with an experience that I had when I was um, a college student, um, just starting out. I'm not going to read it to you. It's, it's too extended to read it to you, but I'm, I'll tell you about it just a little bit so you have a sense of a way of, of coming at a big subject, the subject of privilege, right, in a way that's <clears throat> very personal and humble. So I was a first-generation college student. No one in my entire extended family uh, had ever gone to college. And uh, I'm, I'm, I said I was a working class uh, boy, and, and uh, our family is Jewish. Um, and um, we lived in Brooklyn, and, uh, and we all spoke the way we spoke. You know, I, I, had, I was a good student. I went to a very good high school in New York City. Uh, and then I went to the City University of New York. The tuition was $20 a year. We could handle that. We couldn't do handle much more than that. That was the tuition for the year at the City University of New York. And uh, so we'd go in, and, uh, and I had the first English professor I had in school. It was a guy named Professor Stone. Um, this is, as you can imagine, rather a long time ago, right? Rather a long time ago. And I, we had our first paper, I, I, in my paper, and he gave back the papers, and I got A plus on my paper. Good, A plus on my paper. 
as I went up to get my, my A-plus paper from the hand of Professor Stone, he said, uh, I want you to make an appointment with the administrator of the department and come up and see me. So, of course, I look at the paper and I figure, well, he must want to tell me how great I am. Yeah, after all, right? I mean, I got A+. Plus. I was just starting my college career. He must say, hey, you know, you, you got a great future ahead of you. You know, maybe you'd like to join the literary magazine. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know. I figured, well. So, of course, I, I, I make the appointment and I go up to see the guy. And... Uh, tells me to have a seat, and uh, this was a City University of New York. Believe me when I tell you, um, you never had appointments with professors. They didn't see you. No, there were no office hours, there was nothing, nothing. This was the only time I ever, in my four years at the college, had an appointment with one of my professors at the City University of New York, right? I go up there, and he tells me to sit down. He invites another professor to come in the room introduces me, and he says, uh, no, tell uh, Professor Magdalena right here about the paper you just got back. So I, I tell him about it. It's about George Orwell, by the way. And I go on for a few sentences. He says, okay, 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 that's enough, that's enough. Okay, that's, that's fine. And he says, you, you see, you see what I was telling you? Yeah. And the guy then, I'll cut to the chase. And he says, you know, you're the first one in your family who's ever gone to college? I say, yeah. He says, well, you know, you write really well. I said, well, thank you very much. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, again, he's, he's going to recommend me to some fantastic thing. He says, I got to tell you, when you open your mouth, oh, he says, if you continue to talk the way you talk, of course, I've been raising my hand in the class and so on, quote, this is very long time ago, right? 62 years ago, he said, no one will ever take you seriously. He told me that the sounds I made as a Brooklyn boy right, uh, were such that no one could possibly take me seriously. Of course, this is, can you well imagine, the first time I had ever heard anything remotely like this. I mean, it was, took me a while to process it and so on. The other professor who'd been invited in, you know, said the same thing, you know, basically supported my professor. And uh, they then said, you know, you must immediately enroll in speech therapy courses for the rest of your career and learn uh, to get rid of your Brooklyn accent. Now, of course, everyone in my family spoke the same way. We all lived in Brooklyn. Um, my grandparents were immigrants from Eastern Europe and so on. And, uh, you know, so of course I, uh, I was not at all defensive about this. I was humiliated. I was humiliated. My feelings were hurt, you know. But <clears throat> I did exactly what I was told. Uh, I enrolled in speech therapy. I took speech therapy courses for seven semesters. Um, and I did what I was supposed to do, which is to say I worked on changing the way I spoke. Now, this is a story I tell at the front of my chapter on privilege, in part because it, um, I'm, I'm talking to you as a, as a writer, right? Talking to you just for a moment as a writer because it makes me what I am and what I was, young, vulnerable, right? Uncomfortable, um, not like the guy who speaks in that opening chapter that I read you, right, the first couple pages from, right? And I wanted my reader of my book to hear this other voice, a vulnerable, young voice, right, coming from another kind of perspective altogether. And of course, on that basis, I wanted to be able to introduce to my reader um, the thought that the subject of privilege is complicated. It's not easy. 
it's a word that has been weaponized, right? It can be, I give many examples of this in my book. It can be used um, in a very casual way to put people down, not for anything that they've done, but for what they are, right? So, you know, you say someone is the beneficiary of privilege without knowing anything in particular about the person you are accusing of privilege. That it's important to know something more about someone than that the person is male and therefore has male privilege, right? Just to take one example, which male? What kind of privilege? So one of the things I do when I give my story about my encounter with a professor as a freshman student in the college is to ask whether I was not, at that moment, the beneficiary of an extraordinary kind of privilege. The privilege of having been insulted and humiliated and made strange, right? We don't think of privilege in that way, right? I was given the extraordinary right, privilege of being insulted and humiliated and made to feel that there was something I needed to do at once. Now, of course, you might very well legitimately dispute what that professor told me. Right? We could disagree about this. Um, I'm a very close friend of the writer Jamaica Kincaid. Um, and when Jamaica read, she has a blurb on my book, when she read that incident in the book, she said, I would have grabbed that professor and thrown him down the stairs uh, for saying that to you. I'm, I'm not making that up. She said, I would have grabbed him by the two shoulders and I would have thrown him down the stairs right? for, for insulting and humiliating you in the way uh, that, that he did. So, so we, could, we could disagree about this, right? But I, because of who I was, what I was, where I came from, I uh, had no inclination to challenge what I had been told. I, I didn't think I had the grounds for, for resisting what I'd been told, and I came to think of it as a privilege, and I did it, um, right? And then, of course, I began, as I thought about it in writing, in writing the book, in writing the chapter about privilege, I began to think, well, think about the privilege uh, enjoyed by my professor, um, who felt um, clearly no reluctance at all to insult and humiliate me, um, right? After all, what could I do to him? So he had an extraordinary privilege as well. And that was a sort of a way for me into the whole subject of privilege for thinking about it in racial terms and in gender terms um, and to try to suggest that it's not an easy subject. It's actually very complicated. Um, and there are ever so many other things like privilege which we've come to employ in ways that suggest that we have no notion of how complicated they are to think about and how uneasy we should be when we reach for them and use them as weapons to put people down instead of thinking about what um, those people actually are, what kinds of privilege they actually do enjoy. And one of the things that I say in, in this book is that, of course, even if you think about Privilege is a very complicated subject. Well, it's not only a complicated subject, it's something that exists, it's real. Privilege exists, it's real, right? Um, right? We, all, we all have different versions of privilege and we all enjoy different kinds of privilege. There is no question about that. Um, anyone who doesn't know that there really is something um, that goes under the name of white privilege has just not really thought at all, right? Of course, of course there's white privilege. I mean, if you deny that, you're just, you're not thinking, you know. Um, and is there such a thing as male privilege? Of course there's such a thing as male privilege, right? Uh, the question is, you know, what kind of white privilege, what kind of male privilege, when, in what circumstances, and so on. One has to actually 
think about these things. Um, and so that's, that's you know, one of the things that I, I, I sort of try to do um, in this book. And again, um, one of the related things I do is, is, is um, to tell colorful stories um, that will place the reader um, where, where I myself am placed, and uh, so I can, so you can think in very concrete terms about what all of these ideas amount to when you employ them. I could go on for a very long time, and I'd be happy to do that, but I would much sooner respond to, um, to questions um, or statements, and so would anyone like to start us off? Thank you. Um, yeah, you said earlier you got letters from professors about things happening on their campuses. Care to elaborate more on that? I'm just kind of curious, you know, of some of the instances they maybe wrote about, who mm -hmm. wrote to you about. Sure. Um, well, of course, in some cases, um, they, wrote, they wrote to me about the kinds of things that we've been reading about in um, in the newspapers and magazines dealing with um, affairs um, on campuses all across the country. Some of these um, developments have gotten um, national attention. I'm talking about incidents at places like Middlebury College um, where a controversial speaker um, was uh, prevented from speaking, uh, which that, that, that itself is a, an interesting subject for us to talk about. Perhaps, perhaps, maybe not. Um, and, and violence was finally uh, the result of the efforts to block the controversial speaker. And uh, so there's that. There have been other comparable incidents um, at Oberlin College, um, at Northwestern University. I mean, dozens and dozens of schools. There have been recent stories about um, developments at Williams College, and, for example. But let me give you a very concrete example of, kind of, of this kind of thing, and the kind of thing that I, that I, I got letters about. Um, at Northwestern, um, which you know, was in Evanston, Illinois, right? it's, a, it's a very good school. It's a very good school. Um, there, uh, there's a professor of uh, journalism, um, and um, she, about four or five years ago, published uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, an article, very controversial uh, article. Um, I, w I would not write this article <laughs> myself, but she wrote it. Um, and uh, in the article, she questioned um, a certain kinds of prohibitions and restrictions on relations between um, uh, members of departments and department chairs or administrators, um, generally romantic relationships, right? And even um, about relationships between graduate students and faculty and graduate faculty at the university. So she raised, she said, I, I don't really understand why um, these kinds of relationships should be prohibited. Okay. Again, I, I wouldn't write this article myself, um, and I'm 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 pretty fearless when it comes to most things. But I I, I would not write that article. Um, but she wrote it and was published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and um, the this professor was um, then brought up on uh, Title IX charges um, uh, on the grounds that. Uh, students at the university, at Northwestern University, remember she didn't publish this in a campus publication, she published it in a national publication, she was brought up on charges on the grounds that she had, by virtue of publishing that article, article created a hostile and unsafe environment on the Northwestern campus, simply by virtue of her being there and walking on the campus and going to school. Um, so, that, that was, you know, the kind, that's the kind of, of issue that we get. And of course, it gets into a very <clears throat> complicated area of what's sometimes called free speech controversy, um, right? Right, there's such a thing, a question. What, what do we mean when we talk about free speech? Uh, I'm not a free speech absolutist. There are certain things that, that I will not allow to be said in my classroom, for example. Um, 
a student in my classroom cannot say about a story handed in by another student, that's stupid. Uh, I would say, no, we, we, don't, we don't speak to one another that way. We don't call one another stupid. We don't call one another's work stupid. If we do that, we won't be able to have civil conversation in the room. So no, that's not permissible. But you know, there are all sorts of complicated issues involved in free speech. Uh, perhaps some of you have read recently, again, in, in the national news, um, <clears throat> about disputes ar around the use of the N-word. Um, a, a very important black writer named Walter Mosley, one of the most successful black writers in the country, wrote an article in the New York Times op-ed page about this about two months ago. I don't know if you saw it, but you could, you could Google it, Walter Mosley, right, um, the, the, the N-word. And so Walter Mosley, again, a prominent black writer, was reading out a passage of a, of a literary text that he was teaching, and he read out the N-word. And he was brought up on charges um, for having created um, a hostile and unsafe environment uh, in his classroom. And Walter, um, whom I know just a little bit, wrote an op-ed page article for the Times in which he said, I'm not allowed to read out the N-word in, in a passage of a text. Uh, I, he, he said, quote, I am the N-word. Um, I, 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 I can't read it out. I'm not calling anybody the name. Well, okay, this is one of those many areas in which people disagree. Hmm? And of course you can disagree about when, uh, when that sort of thing is or is not um, so offensive that it creates a hostile environment in which it's impossible to teach, to go on, and to learn. Um, uh, when, I, when I teach the writings of Richard Wright or James Baldwin in my classes, as I always do, um, and they use the N-word. When I read out a passage of a text, uh, I just say, we're not reading out that word. Why? Because there are people in my class who will be so hurt and offended just by hearing the word sounded that it will make what we have to say very difficult to go on with. So we're not, it's not worth it. Why, why are we going to do that? Uh, we, can, we, can just, we can just decide. But, but I have very good friends, including black friends, who are professors who disagree with me about that. They say, no, well, you can, you can read out that word. If it's in a text by Richard Wright, you, you can read that word. Uh, I, well, okay, so we, we, we disagree, right? Um, so again, so-called free speech, right? Well, well sort of, it, it plays well. It's a great, right, it's a great expression, you know, where all of us upholders of free speech. It's again, one of those one of those issues that's a great deal more complicated, right, than it sometimes seems, right? I mean, we all know the example, right? Um, you know, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, even if you feel like, right? Even if you, feel, you, you can't. Context, context has a great deal to do, right, with what we give ourselves permission to say or to do. By the way, there is also a difference between saying certain things in a classroom where you can actually have back and forth intimate conversation and saying the same kinds of potentially explosive or offensive things in a big auditorium where there is no opportunity to have a back and forth. That big difference, right? Big difference. You have a classroom with 20 students, right? And you say something loaded or offensive, or you can talk about it, right? A student can say, I didn't like it when you said X or Y, and you can say, that's interesting, explain that. And then another student can jump in and you can have an exchange. But in a big auditorium, you can't. So I would say, you know, if you're in a big auditorium, um, other kinds of restraint are required. Um, you've got to be more sensitive. Right, in, in the, that setting, that context. Other questions, perhaps? Hmm? Hi, yes. I don't know, I just, um, <laughs> so you talked about um, 
like the privilege of being humiliated earlier. How did that like, how did that play into your writing career? And how did that either keep you going or kind of hold you back from doing certain things? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, again, I, because of, of who I was and where I come from at that time, um, I was not poised to feel offended. Right? I was not poised to hold the professor accountable for doing something terrible to me. I, again, I felt insulted and humiliated, you know, uh, also because I thought I expected something so different. I, I mean, I thought he was going to congratulate me and tell me how great I was, and tell him, instead he was telling me no one would ever take me seriously, um, right? So, I mean, that, that was a big disappointment. Um, but all it did really for me was to make me feel more and more that, uh, you know, I, I wanted to make myself as... Um, impressive a person as I could, and if it meant, if being impressive meant that you also had to sound, right, a certain way, I, I was willing to do that. Now, as I got older, not too much older, I began to think, um, because I began to read more, that there was a, a kind of a class element in this, which made me increasingly feel somewhat uncomfortable, right, as I began to think about it. Because after all, what the professor was saying to me was that, I mean, I'm, tr I'm translating it, right? I didn't hear it this way when he said it to me. He was saying to me, you sound low class. You sound low class. And therefore, right, if you sound low class, no one will ever take you seriously, right? And, uh, you know, and, and so I had to think you know, a great deal more about the class bias that was built into this encounter with this professor. And of course, as I got older, um, and I began to think more about it, and I did think a lot about it over all the decades and so on, very often I told this story to my own students at, at, at my dinner table. Um, we have uh, six student assistants who always work for our magazine, and we have them uh, over to our house for dinner several times a semester, and we have you know, intimate talks with them about their lives and my life and so on. And very often the students um, that we would have to the house would be very offended on, on my account um, by the story that I told. And, and they would say they would never tolerate you know, what, what I had tolerated. Right? They say, no, I would never, if a, if a professor said that to me, I would never tolerate it. I would bring them up on charges and so on. But that notion of bringing someone up on charges, I mean, that would, it would never have occurred to me in a thousand years. Uh, I looked up to this professor who is like a god, you know. Uh, he was, you know, learned, he spoke beautifully, uh, he dressed beautifully, and the idea of bringing him up on charges, after all, I mean, he hadn't. He hadn't touched me, he hadn't, right? he hadn't violated my space or anything like this. He just gave me some advice, you know. Um, so I just took it as one of the forms of advice that I, I came to take, you know, over the course of my young lifetime. And I say this, you know, I, I was a person who took advice. I was also a kind of a rebellious person. I mentioned I was a war resistor. Um, I thought I was going to go to prison. Um, because I refused to, uh, to meet the requirements of, of the draft board at a time when there was a draft. Um, and, uh, but still, I, I was willing to take advice. And so this was just another form of what I thought of as, as good advice. Yeah. It didn't hurt me. I don't think it hurt me. Yeah. Other questions? Shall I ask a question? Oh, great. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I was fascinated, Professor Boyers, by your uh, roundtable discussion that you had or that you orchestrated, and the uh, idea of accepting views from both sides. And I, I have to admit, I had a privileged education as well. And coming up through the ranks, and I taught English for some 30 years, huh. I it was always understood that 
uh, the, teacher, the way a teacher should teach is right down the middle. Here's what they think on the left, here's what they think on the right, now what do you think? Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, let's have a debate and discuss it. And when they asked me, well, Fulton, what do you think? I'd always say, see me after class. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they stop by to see me after class, I continue the charade. I, I call it a charade because I, I think you should let the student leave the room not knowing where you're coming from. And, and I would uh, say, well, I think this way, but the other side thinks that way. Yeah. Um, it, it seems that that trend is gone from teaching these days, mm -hmm. and that it's more at uh, the teacher not hesitating at all to what they say, proselytize, or even some people say indoctrinate from the podium. And I'm wondering if that is is a new trend in academia, and should it be uh, corrected, or what is the? Here's the second question: the mm -hmm. purpose of academia, as I saw it, is to learn the masters, climb to the shoulders of the giant so you can see farther than the giant, mm -hmm. and secondly, to learn the art of criticism. And, and that seems to have gone down the tubes too, uh, because all those old books, the masters, were all written by dead white guys. We, we have these movements today that we'd much rather discuss. Uh, can you comment on, on both the, say, the, the falling out of debates and uh, the, the advent of uh, movements to take over scholastic? Well, of course, you, it's a, as you know, it's a two very big, very broad questions you've, you've raised. Um, I have always felt that there is a, a very, for me, a clear distinction between what goes on in the classroom and what goes on, for example, with my own students at the dinner table. But that's different. Um, and you know, I, I would never say to my students in my class, you know, I come at this material from the perspective of a left liberal. I would never say that, um, never. Um, because after all, that would suggest, um, among other things, that students in the class who don't come at the material from that perspective know that, um, that they're at a somewhat of a disadvantage in the classroom, in the way that I'm going to assess them and think about the things they say. So I don't want to do that at all. But. Uh, but I have to say, I, I do agree that the word you use, proselytizing in the classroom, has become more and more commonplace in certain parts of the academy. I have many young faculty members in my own department right now who would never proselytize in the classroom, uh, who stick to the material um, and, and try to conduct um, debate or discussion exactly in the way that you suggest. But there are other people, and, and, uh, and this has been the case um, going back decades as well, uh, of, of professors who, who use the classroom as a platform uh, in which to promote certain views. There is a debate in higher education now. It has been raging for about 30 years, about 30 years, about whether or not um, the classroom ought or ought not to be used, right, to promote what are sometimes called beneficial social values. Um, there is a book that was published in the early 90s um, by a very brilliant writer named David Bromwich. It's called Politics by Other Means. Um, and he talks specifically about the issue that you've, uh, that you've raised, which is the question of whether or not when we teach and when you learn, right, what we're doing together is um, working to create a better society built around beneficial social ideas. And, um, and that has always seemed to me uh, something that is separate from the, the true mission of the university. The true mission of the university is um, to get people to think about things in as complicated a way as possible and then to make up their minds about those things as they see fit. Um, thinking is the goal, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're all involved in, right? To, to learn how to be better, clearer, more honest thinkers. And so I've, I've always felt that that's, that's the way to do it. But I, you know, there are people who disagree. I, and by the way, I'm very smart people who disagree with that. Um, people who really believe that the, the goal of a higher education is to get people to think the right thoughts and to cling tenaciously 
to those right thoughts. And um, you know that, well, different strokes. Um, and of course, one of the things one of the things that I argue in my new book is that um, this is this is not a, a happy moment um, in the university. Uh, many of the most um, noxious controversies that have evolved over the course of the last 10 or 12 years have exactly to do with this kind of effort to get people on the same page, um, to see things exactly in the same ways, to be able to identify exactly the wrong way to talk and the wrong way to think. You know, I, I'm gonna give you an example because I think it's a kind of a, a, a vivid example and, and I think it's a good one. The shortest chapter in my book um, is devoted to um, um, something that happened at my own school. So it's a very uh, intimate kind of event. Um, a couple of years ago, one of my younger colleagues came running into my office and said, uh, "Do you see the? Did you see the poster that's?" Um, hung up on the door of the English department office. I, I say no, so we go out together, and, uh, and there hung on the English department office door is a poster. You know, I teach at Skidmore College, right? And here's a poster, and it says, big bold letters, keep Skidmore safe. So you think, keep Skidmore safe? Well, you know, yeah, okay, I wanna keep Skidmore safe. You know, s safe from what, you know, but, let, let's, let's know. What do we want to keep Skidmore safe from? Right? So we go down under the, under the heading, and we want to keep Skidmore safe from what it's called ableist language. And ableist language, there are examples given on the poster. What are examples of ableist language? Now think of this comes out of, that term, ableist language, comes out of disability studies, a growing and influential, right, area of scholarly research in the university. I have, I have two very brilliant younger colleagues who are writing books in disability studies that are extremely good, interesting. What are, what's ableist language? I'm gonna give you the examples from the poster, okay? Stand on your own two feet. Learn to walk in someone else's shoes. You've heard expressions like that, yes? Right? These kinds of expressions are identified as offensive and ableist because they could conceivably make um, a disabled person feel uncomfortable. A person who who couldn't stand on his or her own two feet, okay? Now, in disability studies, there are many, many um, instances in which the authors study the way in which expressions of this kind are embedded in the language, in the, most especially in literary language. So if you went to uh, Shakespeare, you'd, or to Charles Dickens, you would find huge numbers of instances of ableist language, right? Okay, you get it, right? So what does the poster say? So okay, so this is fine, you wanna, you, can, you wanna make this argument, you can make the argument, right? And you can talk about it, it's a subject, right? Why not, why not talk about it? Um, but the poster says, if your professor should use an expression of that kind. Turn a deaf ear, right? Cast your eye upon. I'm giving expressions, right? You must immediately tell your professor to stop and never again to use that kind of language. On the poster, if your professor should refuse or if your professor should say okay and continue, to use such language, you are obligated to go to the human resources office and bring your professor up on Title IX charters for creating a hostile environment. These are the steps to go through to do that. So 
what you get here is the creation of what you might call a surveillance society in which ordinary language right, can become right, criminal. You could actually bring people up on charges, right? have them removed from their teaching positions right, for saying, stand on your own two feet, or turn a deaf. It's just... So we then found that every department office in our college, it's a good college, every department office had that poster affixed to its department office door. No department chair in our college had refused to have that poster affixed to the door. Right? So, you know, um, if you've been thinking about the creation in the university of what I call in my book a total culture in which everyone is required to think the same thoughts, speak the same words, right? Well, this seemed to me and to a number of my friends at the, the college a perfect example of the kind of thing we've been talking about. And so, of course, I, um, uh, I immediately wrote to the professor whose disability studies classes had been involved in this, and I said, do you realize you're concerned with creating a hostile environment on the college? Um, could anything be more hostile than encouraging students at this school to bring their professors up on formal charges for saying, right, stand in your own two feet? Could anything be more hostile than that? <clears throat> Um, I also write in, in this chapter that as I was sitting there and thinking about writing the letter to this, uh, to this professor, um, I, of course, thought I was going to take down a Shakespeare volume and search out some ableist expressions and say, you know, you, you, won't, be able to, you won't be able to teach Shakespeare anymore, you know, because it would have all this terrible ableist language, you know, in it. And then I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. Actually, I saw right up on my shelf, um, a extraordinarily popular, important, and influential book um, by ta Coates called Between the World and Me. Um, that had been a book that the year before had been required for all incoming freshman students at the college. And I was teaching a freshman seminar uh, that year, and so I had to teach that book to my classes. Now, of course, when I taught it, I didn't think about ableist language. I mean, I don't think anybody who taught that book was thinking about ableist language. But there it was, it was up on the shelf, so I took down this important book by the most important and influential black writer in the country. And I, I took it down, and I just started browsing through it. And here, one ableist expression after another, after another. And I wrote to this uh, professor who was behind the poster and I said, do you realize if at our college we had been lucky enough to recruit Ta-Nehisi Coates to teach at Skidmore College, you would be asking our students to bring him up on charges and get rid of him? Um, right? Is th that's the logic involved in this in this poster. So, you know, it's, you know it is, it's the kind of thing that some of the time when you think about it, strikes you as quite incredible, but when you find enough examples, enough instances of it, and there are many, right, um, in my book, and uh, then you begin to think, no, I'm actually describing something that's very widespread, that goes very deep in the culture of the university, and it's something that you know, we have to be able to identify and think about. Um, so that's you know, what I've been trying to do. Um, there was another part of your question that I know I didn't address. Scholasticism, uh, the decline of scholasticism. Um, I'm not sure if that. Yeah. Um, 
Ah, oh, I see, I see. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I think um, from what I, I've been traveling a lot uh, over the last several months. I, I've been speaking at at least one college or university uh, every week, in some cases two. And, um, and I, I, I've met a lot of faculty members, and my sense is that um, there, is, there is no sort of specific tendency of, of, of that sort. I see it in some areas. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Right? Um, very often, professors, um, particularly younger professors, not because they're young, but because of their situation, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this, um, are thinking about enrollment in their classes. And many of them think, and I understand this completely, they think, if I'm going to attract significant enrollment in my class, I have to make my class sound sexier and juicier than it used to sound. So if I've been hired um, as a medievalist, right, and I'm worried that I'm not going to get the kind of enrollment that I want in my medieval literature class, I've got to offer my medieval literature class in a sexier way. How? Oh, how about sex in the literature of the Middle Ages? Right? Rather than medieval, I'm not making this up. I mean, I'm not, I'm not creative enough to make these things up, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know. So, but so that, that's a way, you know. It's, it's, it's a way to package the course. Does it mean when you offer a course in sex in the Middle Ages that it has no valid content? No, of course, it doesn't mean that at all. No, you can have a perfectly interesting and valid and challenging course in sex in the literature of the Middle Ages, but, but it's different. Um, it's different. And, you know, one, one would have to study the particular instance, right, and to, in order to determine whether or not the content of the course was serious. Um, and I think in most cases, at least in my experience, it is. It is. But that's the sort of thing that I see in my own department, and uh, I'm not surprised. Um, the, the struggle for enrollment is very real, particularly in the humanities right now. I can tell you that at my school, um, three years ago, uh, these are numbers I just saw on Monday this week, three years ago, there were 95 English majors. Two years ago, there were 85 English majors declared. This year, there are 47 declared English majors. Um, this is a, a trend, it's national, it's national, right? And it affects not just English courses, but humanities courses. And so, very often in the humanities, you do uh, have a serious concern about enrollment, um, and it's not only a concern shared by administrators, but also most especially by younger people who are worried about whether their services will be wanted in the future. You know, that's, I mean, that's maybe not, you know, part of the substance of, certainly has nothing to do with the substance of my book, but it's there, it's real. Well, I think we need to, we're at our end, but um, one, I want to thank you. Also, I want everybody to know, again, the book's for sale out there. Bob, I'm sure, will be happy to sign it, and also take some, you know, continue conversation up here as well. Thank right. you very much for staying with me.